And now I absolutely believe it could be that turning point in mainland China. I think if the world can stand united in condemning the CCP for not only lying and covering up about the coronavirus, and we see, you don't have to look far to see the economic havoc that that's wrecked upon the world, and both in human toil too, with the people who have died and the people who are sick. But if we can hold them accountable for that, and for their gross human rights violations and atrocities, now is the time for us to stand up against the CCP and let the good people of China know we're with you, but we absolutely have fundamental problems with your government. And I think that would go a long way to encouraging them and empowering the good people of China to do what they're going to have to do here in the future is we look to find the day when the CCP no longer is in power over the good Chinese people. Just why exactly was a Chinese consulate letter to Wisconsin State Senator Roger Roth such a blatant attempt to subvert U.S. democracy? How is the Chinese Communist Party responsible for the deaths and economic devastation caused by the global coronavirus pandemic? And why does Senator Roth recommend lawmakers publicly call out the Chinese Communist Party while at the same time standing in solidarity with the Chinese people? In this episode, we sit down with State Senator Roger Roth, who is the Wisconsin Senate President and an Iraqi War veteran. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellick. <music> Senator Roger Roth, such a pleasure to have you on American Thought Leaders. Glad to be with you today. So, not too long ago, you received a very curious email from the Chinese consulate in Chicago it talked about a resolution that the Wisconsin State Senate uh, should adopt, talking about how transparent and quick in sharing of key information China has been sharing with the international community and WHO. Um, some of our viewers have already heard about this, but I'm wondering if you could tell me what exactly happened. You got this note, what happened? Yeah, absolutely. So on February 26th, the consulate first reached out to me and they said that they would like me to pass a resolution on the floor of the Wisconsin Senate. And what was probably most unusual about the request was that they provided me with the resolution. I've never had something like this happen. And they wanted more or less to praise the Communist Party of China for their handling of the coronavirus. But when I looked at the email, I saw that it had a hotmail address and I immediately thought this has to be a hoax. So I discarded it. About a week and a half later, they reached out to me again. And it said, hey, we're just following up on our first email that we had sent you and wondering if you'd be able to pass this resolution on the floor of the Senate. And at this point, I told my staff, just go do some legwork, see if we can validate this email address. So they went ahead and they did that. And uh, towards the uh, third, I think, week in March, we finally got confirmation that this was, in fact, a legitimate email from the Chinese consulate. In fact, it was told to us through the channels that we went through that the Chinese, the communist Chinese, I guess, routinely use private email with their embassy traffic here in the United States because their official channels are too slow. So when I now, in the third week of March, recognize that this, in fact, was legitimate, the Communist Party of China reached out to me on two occasions to pass a resolution praising them for their handling of the coronavirus at the very time that this virus is spreading in the United States, starting on the coast and the west and the east and sort of working its way in. By this time in Wisconsin, we are on lockdown, only essential businesses. Most people are asked to stay home um, and stay indoors. And so all of these emotions are running through me and to be honest with you, I got downright mad. And that's where I told my staff, I dictated to them a response. I said, you send this out word for word, dear Consul General, nuts, respectfully, Senator Roger Roth. And that's what they sent out. And uh, I stand by that um, because I had never before had a foreign government try and subvert our democratic process here and get us to pass misinformation. Never before have I seen that happen on such a brazen level. Well, you know, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, first, I, I would love to understand uh, exactly what you meant by nuts. I'm sure they didn't understand it. 
<laughs> initially, but but you hit the nail on the head. There's some sort of subversion of democracy happening here. And can you dig into that before we kind of go further into this resolution? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you see right now um, the Communist Party of China, they have their tentacles everywhere in our world. And they have it in our business community. They have it in academia. They have it in government. And they're flexing those muscles now to change a narrative, a very disturbing narrative um, in their handling of this coronavirus. And they're flexing that to try and ch change and shape world public opinion about them. And, and that, I guess, is why they reached out to me. But the danger here is that they absolutely are subverting or tr attempting to subvert a democratic process where the people of Wisconsin, we, el we elect as a whole here, our legislators and our state senators uh, to rule in our state legislature. The idea that we would allow a foreign government like the Communist Party of China to have influence over what we pass in the sovereign state of Wisconsin is extremely troubling. And I think people, not just in the United States, but around the world should be alarmed at the efforts in the ends that the Communist Party of China is going through to try and infiltrate and subvert what we do here in our country, all so that they can gain legitimacy on their end. You know, uh, here at the Epic Times, we've we've definitely felt uh, the effects of some of that kind of outreach from the Chinese Communist Party over the last 20 years. So, so we're no we're no strangers to exactly what you're talking about. But this is also really interesting. I mean, cr this coronavirus, this whole situation is kind of as I speak with folks on the show, they keep telling me it's like this alarm bell, that's sort of showing this type of activity, exposing this type of activity. I mean, have you? ever gotten a, a note of this nature from any foreign mission before? From time to time, you will have the foreign consulates will reach out. And many of them, a lot of the big nations, they have those consulates around the United States, including in Chicago, which is just south of where we're at. So I've absolutely had other governments, you know, they're in town, um, want to say hi, want to tell me about, you know, what they're working on and what their government's up to. I have never had a foreign consulate present me with something that they wanted me to pass on the floor of the sovereign Wisconsin State Senate. Never. And to me, that was the most shocking of this was just the brazen nature for them to feel. Here's probably the part that should scare most of us. They actually felt it was OK for them to do this. So it makes you wonder, am I the first one that they've reached out to? to ask for a resolution to be passed or to ask for a public statement to be made on their behalf or a social media post to be sent out there. I find it hard to believe that I would be. I've, and so the fact that they felt that it was okay for them to do this and not out of normal, I think is the scariest part for me, which is why I was so determined after I worked through the stages of anger to turn this into a real opportunity. And that was to present what I believe to be a factual resolution that strips naked the aggression in the human rights abuses of the Communist Party of China for the world to see. Because now we see what they've done with the coronavirus. Now is the opportunity for the free world to unite in opposition to the CCP and in support of the real freedom loving peoples of mainland China. I, I'm actually excited to dig into your resolution because I think it's it, it covers a lot of uh, very, very important ground. But before I go there, why do you think they reached out to you? That's a great question. And I've, I've asked myself that. And of course, many people have asked me that. And the only thing I can think of is that if you go to the Wisconsin State Senate homepage, I'm the first person you see is the president of the Senate. I'm the first photograph, first contact information. And they must have thought, well, this is where we go to get this done. But again, to me, it's downright scary that they even made that request in the first place because I've had no contact with the CCP. I've never traveled to China. I've never spoken to their consulate before. So that's why it makes this request very unusual and very scary that they felt that this was normal behavior for a foreign government to come to a sovereign state like Wisconsin and ask them to pass this resolution.
Are you aware of any other legislat uh, legislator, uh, state, federal, or otherwise, uh, being reached out to in this manner? I do know that Secretary Pompeo gave a speech in February, and I only know this in the after effects of everything that I had gone through. And he was speaking at the, the National Governors Association, and he was you know, more or less telling them um, that you know, the Communist Party of China is going to be looking to flex their muscles and influence behavior in the United States. And I came across that after the fact. But once I had seen that, and he had gone through and shared with some examples um, of how they had done things in other states, it made total sense. That being said, this is the first instance that I am aware of where they actually handed a sovereign legislative body a resolution that they wanted passed. Fascinating. So what is the status of the resolution now? So I introduced the resolution uh, in the Senate. We in the, are in the middle of this battle here against the coronavirus. So the Senate met last week in a virtual session solely to take up legislation dealing with the coronavirus. We absolutely will be coming back, convening our Senate in our Senate chamber at some point when the conditions on the ground improve whether that's late May or June sometime, we'll be coming back. And that's the time that I'll be making the push here to pass this resolution in solidarity with the Chinese people. And I've gotten very good feedback from a number of my colleagues who are very supportive of what we are doing. Um, so let's jump into the this your resolution now um, that basically, as far as I can tell, is attempting to you know, comprehensively discuss the reality of what the Chinese Communist Party has inflicted on China and, and frankly, now the world. Tell me about the resolution. Yeah, well, I came in, you know, again, going through all that anger over a weekend, and I approached my staff at the beginning of the next week, and I said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put out a resolution. It's just not the one that the CCP wants, but we're going to put out a resolution that that walks the the fine line between supporting the good Chinese people and yet at the same time um, uh, calling out for what it is, the aggressions of the Communist Party of China. Um, and I think you'll see that play out from the beginning uh, to the end here. You know, I talk about, and I really do believe this, the Chinese people, they are heirs to a great civilization spanning thousands of years of human history. They've just been held hostage these last 70 years by the Communist Party of China. And I told my staff, I want to put together a resolution that highlights some of these. Because if you go out on the street, maybe it's different where you are, but if we go out on the street in Madison, Wisconsin, and we ask somebody about the Communist Party of China, if we said, in fact, if we just said this, do you believe that somewhere in the world, there are a million and a half Uyghur Muslims who are in concentration camps. Just left it at that. Didn't put a geographic name to it. Most people would say that's impossible. Concentration camps were something back in World War II that doesn't exist today, except that it does. And I don't think most people understand just the atrocities that have been allowed to happen under the CDC when it comes to the one child policy and the forced sterilizations in the orgus harvesting and the religious liberties uh, that they infringe upon. All of these things that we know that, you know, mainland China exists and they have that government, but, but we don't directly tie these things to them. And I wanted to allow this to be an opportunity where we spell that out. So you will see that in our resolution, we declare those. And then at the same time, I wanted this resolution to speak truth to the lies that the CCP is spreading around the world about what actually happened with the spread of the co coronavirus. And you see us do that too, kind of laying from the beginning of the process, their cover up, um, how they went and imprisoned scientists who dared speak the truth, how they destroyed samples, how they lied to the world, to the WHO, uh, to the United States, and really allowed this thing to grow into something that in the very end, we can't control anymore. We're just reacting to on, an, on a worldwide level. Now, you mention in here that the Chinese Communist Party deliberately and intentionally misled the world about the outbreak in Wuhan. And the, the deliberately part, I'm most curious about. What do you mean exactly? Well, we know that the Chinese government knew about this in the middle of November. 
And by early December, they knew that there was human to human transmission. Yet publicly, there was saying there wasn't, can only get this from an animal, even though they knew that there was human to human transmission. And then their deliberateness of what they did was when they destroyed samples of the virus, or when they should have done is allowed researchers in the United States and other parts of the world access to that so we could develop, not only use it to help determine and predict mapping of how it would spread, but also start working on, on finding a vaccine to it. But from the moment they found out about this until it was too late, they lied to the world. They lied to their own people, they lied to the World Health Organization, and they lied to the world. And that's why um, I think it's very important, you know, we're hearing this might be a thing of the future. I mean, we're so blessed, you and I and everyone listening now, that for the most part of our lives, we've lived in a world absent of these kind of pandemics. Science, we've been able to, in technology, we've been able to harness and control these, but they're saying this might be the future. And if that's true, then now more than ever, we need to hold China, the Communist Party of China, the World Health, and the World Health Organization accountable for their handling of this to make sure that the next time this happens, if it does, we don't find ourselves in the same predicament. Well, so you're mentioning the WHO here. You know, of course, there's been a lot of criticism. The president has recently, you know, is said he's defunding it, pending investigation of its role in all of this. Um, so you, you think the WHO is somehow complicit? Is that what I'm hearing? I absolutely think that they're complicit in what's happening here. And we don't have the full scope of the details, but I think many of the things that are reported in the mainstream media, even today, uh, you would acknowledge that there was a cozy relationship between the, the CCP and the World Health Organization. I mean, they, the World Health Organization didn't even declare. There were, there were 500 people dying a day in Italy, and they still aren't declaring this a world pandemic until the middle of March. And I believe that was all coming from pressure from China to try and minimize what this was. You know, the sad truth is that is if, if the CCP had been forthright and honest from the beginning, you know, they might be afraid of what public opinion in the world is towards them. But the truth is that we would have stood ready to come in immediately and help them with this. We would have done the necessary, sent in the necessary scientists, supplies, what have you, to make sure that this didn't spread outside of the Wuhan province of China or in China at large. But by doing the lying, the deliberate lying and misinformation, all they did, you'll see in the resolution that they wanted me to pass, you know, they're saying, oh, we created a window of opportunity for the world to react. Nonsense. All they did was create a window of opportunity for the coronavirus to spread in such force around the world that by the time governments realized what we were facing, it was too late to respond in a way that wouldn't jeopardize the lives of our citizens and their health. Well, you know, if they would have had to admit, uh, you know, there was a problem, perhaps the uh, Chinese Communist Party might be held accountable. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you're right about that. But you know what? They're going to be held accountable now. Uh, both the, the CCP and the World Health Organization are going to be accountable. I'm actually a little encouraged um, when, you know, again, is, is this sort of happened to me, is they've sort of tried to manipulate my office for their gains here. And I've seen now what they're not only what they're capable of, but what they've tried to do around the world. I think you do see governments around the world pushing back. You see in Germany, you see in Great Britain, and even here in the United States, um, with hearings now that are going to happen on the halls of Congress, that we are absolutely pushing back, and they will be held accountable as they should be. So what are you hearing from your colleagues? Uh, you've, you've reached out, presumably, to your colleagues in the Senate, even though you're not in session around these issues. What, are you hearing it? Are we, are, is there you know, bipartisan interest in the resolution? What's the situation? I don't know if there is uh, yet to be determined, I think, if there is bipartisan support for it. I think in the end there will be. But I can definitely tell you on the Republican side of the aisle that uh, my members have reached out to me and told me that they absolutely and enthusiastically support the resolution because they're hearing it from, from their own people. You know, this isn't lost on them that, that something happened here. And, you know, as we look in our response to this, you know, our number one priority right now is keeping our people safe. 
So it's working with our, our health departments in our healthcare systems, uh, emergency management in the state of Wisconsin. It's doing the right things to make sure that the people of Wisconsin are safe. But when we move through this, and this passes as surely it will, that will be the time when we reassess what we're doing and we determine, you know, hold people accountable and determine where blame lies. But I'll tell you right now, I've got people in my district. I represent a district in Northeast Wisconsin, about 177,000 people. And many of them have lost their jobs. And some of them have even died by the coronavirus. And we've got people who are infected by it and having to quarantine at their home. Schools have been shut down. Seniors aren't going to be able to graduate. Sports seasons now have been canceled for, for folks. They're asked to stay home. All these things happen because China lied. We could have prevented an economic collapse here in the entire world. We could have prevented uh, the job loss and the death and the sickness and disease around the world had China not lied. That's where in my resolution I talk about how a study was done in the United States, and they found that 95% of the cases of infection around the world would not have happened had China been, from the beginning, upright and honest with what was going on. And that's why they should be held accountable. You have the state of Missouri now passed a, a law, and they're going to allow their people to sue China here uh, for grievance. And while I haven't looked in that fully to see the total extent of that, uh, you have people who are mad around the United States and the world at how the Communist Party of China has lied and allowed this to spread and develop, and I think it is rightly deserved. We need to hold them accountable, and I'm hopeful this is that moment when public opinion now around the world recognizes the CCP for who they are so we can understand who they are. And as we go forward in dealing with new trade negotiations and understanding what our relationship will be in the future, we will at least know the kind of of uh, entity here that we're dealing with. Well, you know, what's what's interesting about the Missouri lawsuit uh, situation is that they're explicitly calling out the Chinese Communist Party, actually much as you do in your resolution. And actually, what I would like you to speak to that a little more deeply, you know, this distinction, but you distinguish between the Chinese Communist Party, China, the Chinese people. And, and what is the purpose of that? Absolutely. I know, you know, through my uh, more, I guess, basic understanding of, of world history, as, as most of us have, I know that the CCP is not China. They were just a group, a militant group, that was able to more or less conquer the good people of China at the end of World War II and impose their will on them. And that's why I absolutely like using the phrase that the CCP is holding the good people of China hostage, because that's really the way I look at it. If the people of China had a vote in their government, they wouldn't be supporting the CCP. And governments like theirs, they have to lead this, their surveillance that they put on their people, watching their every move, giving them a social score, having that determine whether or not they get access to a loan or can use public transportation or determine what kind of food and how much they can have. They do that because the only way they can stay in power is to control their people which is at the, the antithesis of how we operate here in the West and in the United States. So I knew from the beginning that this isn't a battle between the United States and China and the people of China. This is a battle between you know, the Western world, uh, freedom and liberty and the CCP. And that's why I wanted to make that decision. We actually stand in solidarity with the Chinese people. And I know if they didn't have the threat of their government, if they didn't face the threat of retaliation against them, I know uh, absolute certainty that these people would not uh, support the government that they have. If we gave them a choice, they wouldn't be supporting the government that they have right now. And, and I just wanted to, to let people know that there has to be a distinction. The P, other, otherwise, what happens is that the Chinese government will take these words and they will use their state-run media, and they will let their people know that, you know what, whatever you're hearing about the West and about freedom, they actually hate you. They're against you and what you stand for. And that's why I want to make sure in everything that I say, and I encourage others, that we separate it. We talk CCP and the Chinese people, because they have to know, and the word has to get to them, is I know that it is. 
that the free people around the world stand in solidarity with them. And we long for the day when they can rise out of the grip of control of the CCP and stand in a world of freedom. And when that day comes, I and many of us in the world will welcome them as we welcome that time. You know, very, very powerful words from you. I mean, you know, I, I've always thought that one of the biggest hoaxes that the Chinese Communist Party has inflicted on its own people and frankly the world as well is that there is, it kind of conflates itself with China and the Chinese people. And then, as you said, actually very adroitly, um, you have Chinese people be essentially defending its uh, terrible actions because they feel, you know, personally uh, connected, like as if attacking the CCP is attacking China and is attacking me. Uh, it, it, powerful, powerful words. Where does your passion for this come from? I mean, I'm getting a lot of passion here from you. And, and from what I understand from when we talked earlier, you, you haven't been to China, but this is obviously incredibly important to you. Well, it is, and, I'm, and I am very passionate about it. And I tell my staff, because they're you know, uh, participants here and watching when I'm doing my different interviews and so forth, and they can just tell, you know, you know, my blood starting to boil and so forth. And and the way I look at it, you're right, I haven't been to China. Um, I certainly studied it in, in college here. I was a history major, so studied Chinese history and so forth. So I have a, a, a bit of a connection there. But what it really, it's a, it's a human struggle. And this is something that, that spans uh, civilizations for all time in our world. And it's a struggle between freedom and totalitarianism, between people having uh, the choice to do with what they want with their lives and then having somebody else tell them uh, what they must do and how they must live. And that's why when I look at the, the Chinese people, you know, I see us in them. There was a time when we had to go through that struggle here in the United States, and we had to fight for the rights that we have here in setting up the government that we have. And that's why, you know, I see what they are going through, the pain and the agony and the anguish here of, of the people, and I can empathize with that. But I also know that in the end of the day, if you look at history, right always wins out. It always wins out in the end. It's just we have to go through some very bad times because of some of the choices we make. But I think now is that time. You know, we like to think that the world we live in, that this is the way it's going to be, you know, for all time. But yet if you go, people said that forever, only to see that the world changes. And now I absolutely believe it could be that turning point in mainland China. I think if the world can stand united, in condemning the CCP for not only lying and covering up about the coronavirus, and we see, you don't have to look far to see the economic havoc that that's wrecked upon the world, and both in human toil too with the people who have died and the people who are sick. But if we can hold them accountable for that and for their gross human rights violations and atrocities, now is the time for us to stand up against the CCP and let the good people of China know we're with you, but we absolutely have fundamental problems with your government. And I think that would go a long way to encouraging them and empowering the good people of China to do what they're going to have to do here in the future is we look to find the day when the CCP no longer is in power over the good Chinese people. The passion in your voice is unmistakable and, you know, you know, very, very thoughtful words here. Um, our sister TV network, NTD, which is actually the only independent broadcaster that broadcasts directly into China via satellite and all sorts of uh, VPNs, all sorts of, 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 of interesting ways to get through the Chinese censorship, I'm sure will be translating this interview and, and sharing it. So, uh, so it, it, this, will, this will go a lot further than, than just America. If you had a few words that you would like to say you know, directly to the Chinese people, to the Chinese viewer inside mainland China, what would you say? Well, I would say that most importantly, we stand in solidarity with you. And I know it can be difficult because under state controlled media and around an internet that has a firewall up, uh, you don't always get the truth. And then what you do here coming from the United States and from uh, free countries around the world is only negative things meant to misinform you about how the rest of the world really feels about the struggle that you're going through. But make no mistake about it, the human struggle is one of people going uh, from oppression and bondage into freedom and liberty. And you are in that right now. And the good people of the world stand united. All freedom peoples everywhere are united uh, with the people of China. 
You know, I think that if you looked back um, to the Cold War, and I think there's a lot of illustrations between the United States and the struggle we had with Russia at that time and what's happening now in the world is, you know, the the Russians sort of have taken a step backwards on the world stage, but certainly the Communist Party of China is taking a step forwards. Um, there was a time that President Kennedy went to Berlin and he gave a speech there and he told the people in his, he said, Ich bin ein Berliner, which translated to where uh, we are all Berliners. And what he was saying, I think, in the context of his speech is that if you go through history, there was a time when the greatest boast in all the world was to say that you were a Roman. Um, and he was saying to the people of Berlin at that time that he believes that the greatest boast is that you are a West Berliner. And I would say right now in the struggle for freedom and liberty, the greatest boast you can have in all the world is to be uh, one of those freedom fighters in mainland China who is struggling for their freedom and liberty. We stand with you and we stand in solidarity with the struggle that you are going through. Senator Roth, you know, I'm very, very curious about, you know, how your awareness of the Chinese reality, which obviously you're very, very uh, clear on at the moment, how that has evolved over, let's say, the past decade and so forth. I mean, even going back, you know, 10 years, certainly 15 years, the Kissinger doctrine was in play. Um, and most people uh, had a very, very different perception of the realities in China, even though some of the exact same stuff that we know is a reality today was happening. And I, I, I'm, can you speak to that a little bit, how sure. your perception has changed and were there some milestones along the way? Yeah, I think if you went back 15 or 20 years, you know, certainly into the middle 90s and, and forward, I think the, the thought around the world was, you know, if we can just open up China's markets, if we can let them uh, into the WTO and we can let them into, you know, have increased trade in, in free markets and access of goods flowing back and forth, that we can somehow uh, tame the CCP, that if we do that, we can somehow use that as a force uh, to change them. In all we found out, how history really bore out, was that every time we extend an olive branch to the CCP, every time in good faith we extend them an opportunity to join our trading organizations and to take part in uh, world commerce, uh, they do just the opposite. They exploit the institutions that we put in place. Uh, they steal our technology. They extort our businesses who try to open up uh, in, in work and in, in have access to their markets. And at every turn, they're working against and undermining our way of government and our way of life. And I think at the time, if you went back, you would have you would have thought that, oh, this could play out right. But now in 2020, we recognize that that's not the way it's worked. In fact, the more we march down that road and the more access they're given and the stronger their economy does, the more they're shutting their people off to the world, the more they're using uh, social media and the internet to control the lives of their people, using that technology to control the lives of their people, using their military uh, to wreak havoc in, in the Pacific region of the world through the Spratly Islands and so forth. And so I think right now the current administration, the Trump administration, I think has the right approach. And it really goes back a bit to what Ronald Reagan had when he was dealing with the Russians. Um, I think part of it was peace through strength. And I think that's an important concept. But then second, also trust but verify. And I think the day is long since passed when we're just going to on its face accept what the CCP says is truth. We're going to verify. And in no other case do you see that happening than in what's happened with the coronavirus, where we kind of trusted them in the month of December. And we trusted them in the World Health Organization in the month of January, only to find out that we had been lied to and totally unprepared to deal with this pandemic. So this is that turning point, I believe. This is the opportunity where the free world can now stand up uh, in unison and speak against and condemn the wrong, the, the lying and the deceit, and of course the human rights violations of the CCP. Uh, now is that time, now is that opportunity. You know, and uh, you know, what more powerful uh, document is there than this, you know, resolution which the Chinese consulate officially sent you, you know, which is filled with overt lies and mistruths. 
It's, a, it, it's, it's truly remarkable. Um, any final words before we finish up? Yeah, I would just say that um, uh, what they did was quite remarkable and quite brazen at that, which is why I wanted to make sure that our response was equally as strong. Um, and the reason I, you know, in, in dealing with the CCP and dealing with their consulate, I used the one word when I said nuts to respond to what they were asking me to do, uh, because I think that it on its surface is so ridiculous that what other thing can you say to what they are doing? So to the rest of the world, if the CCP has reached out to you and asked you to subvert your free governments, I just ask that you would tell them nuts. And if they've reached out to you, other lawmakers in the world, and asked them to parrot lies and untruths, I would just ask that you would respond to them nuts. And if you're one of those individuals in mainland China right now who doesn't have freedom and liberty, but one day we know that you will, I would just ask you to look towards your government and raise your hand and say nuts, because the rest of the world now recognizes the CCP for who they are. And if we stand in unison against them and against their actions, that can bring about, that can be the catalyst for the change that we need in this world. Senator Roger Roth, such a pleasure to have you on. Appreciate it. Thank you.